right. All right. Well, hey, it's so great to see you today. You know, whether you're watching online or you're here in the room, I am so excited to be here with you. As Dan said, you know, my name is Adam. I'm the recovery lead here. And I just want you to know I love, love being on staff with this incredible staff and leadership team. We have some amazing leaders. We have an amazing executive team, elders here, obviously Dan. And, you know, they just do a tremendous, tremendous job throughout the year. Can we just give a hand uh, to the staff here? You know, and I want you to know that just because I'm on staff here at Valley Real Life, that doesn't mean that I live this perfect life. In fact, I probably struggle more than most. Actually, my life looks a little bit like this. There's a lot of messiness going on. There's, there's some struggles. There's some different things that happen. There's a lot of movement and navigation that needs to take place. How about you? Does your life look a little bit like this at times? Is there any struggles that happen within your life or any movement that needs to take place often? Navigating through a life like this can be very, very difficult. But I want you to know that navigating through a life like this with the Holy Spirit is much more manageable. You know, we've been in this series called The Forgotten God. And hasn't this been an incredible series? I've, I've just loved um, learning and growing about the Holy Spirit and, and l- learning more about the Holy Spirit. We've learned about how the Holy Spirit liberates us. We've learned about how the Holy Spirit adopts us, how he transforms us, how he guides us, and how the Holy Spirit even prays for us when we don't even know what to pray for ourselves. It's incredible. And as Zach shared, we learned from John last week how the Spirit unifies us. And honestly, that's what I love about Valley Real Life. As I walk into this place and I walk into these doors, it honestly feels like family. I love this place. And I know that the Spirit is at work in this place because of that. But tonight I get to finish with one thing for you uh, in this sermon series. I get to share with you about how the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and difficult situations to draw us nearer to God. You know, a few years ago, um, I got my wisdom teeth pulled out. And first point in this message I want to share with you, don't wait until you're 40 years old to get your wisdom teeth pulled. But the very next day after I got my wisdom teeth pulled, my wife left on a continuing education um, class, and, and I had the opportunity to take my sons up to Sandpoint with a friend and watch a soccer game. Now, many of you know that soccer in the spring, the weather in this area can be a little bit brutal. And so we get to the soccer game, we get to the soccer game, and it is raining sideways, and it is miserable, and it's snowing, and it's windy. And I, did I mention that I got my wisdom teeth out the night before, so my face is just swollen? And as we get to the soccer, we, we set up this half dome tent and it's just pouring rain inside of this half dome tent. And my son lasts about 10 minutes and him and his friend asked me, can we go to the car and warm the car up? And I said, absolutely. And I gave them the keys. I said, here, go warm the car up. I'll be there after the game. So I wait for my other son to finish the game and we walk to the car. And as, as we're walking to the car, I notice something strange. My son and his friend are standing outside of the sunroof. Now, the sunroof is made for sun. It is pouring down rain. I get to the car, and I'm like, what are you doing? And they said, well, we turned the car on, we started the heater, and we opened the sunroof because we wanted to see the game better. There is standing water inside of my car. The roof is soaking wet. The battery had died because they didn't actually start the car. I was so frustrated because there's standing water in the car. I just got my wisdom teeth out and I'm in pain. And you can imagine the passion, or some might call it anger, as I reacted to my kids because I needed to get my car jumped at that time. But you know what was funny? Is in these funny stories, these moments in our life, as I was driving home, The Spirit of God was convicting me on how I acted and reacted to my boys. 
And it's crazy how in that moment, he drew me closer to, the, to, to him. And I know in that moment, whether it be from my anger or the Holy Spirit, that he drew those boys closer to God as well. <laughs> you know, our scripture for today comes from John chapter 16. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to John chapter 16. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, this is a conversation that's taking place during the last night of Jesus's life. He's about to be offered as a sacrifice for sinners on the cross. He's about to be betrayed by Judas, who has already left the group of disciples. And Jesus is offering this word of comfort and sharing with us that he's going to go away, but he's going to be sending this advocate, the Holy Spirit, to us. So John chapter 16, verse 7 and 8 says, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of sin. If the Spirit's going to convict us of sin, we must, to be drawn closer to God, we must actually understand what sin really is. The Greek word for sin is harmatia. Go ahead and say it with me. Harmatia. Try it one. There we go. Harmatia. It comes from an old England um, archery game where they would take a pole, put it out in a field, and they would put a hoop on top of the pole. And the men would take their arrow and they would point it and they would shoot it through the hoop. If they should miss going through the hoop, they were called a sinner. You've missed the mark. So sin literally means you have missed the mark. Now sinner is a word that most of us wouldn't like attached to us. And sometimes we can get angry or we might be a little bit frustrated if we are referred to as a sinner. And yet when I realize that sin means to miss the mark and the mark is perfection, I'm not ready to stand up here and tell you that I am perfect. In fact, I just showed you what my life really looks like. And I don't think that anybody else is ready to probably stand up here and tell you that they're absolutely perfect, that they've never, never done anything wrong, never thought a wrong thought, never been angry. Anybody? Anybody the picture of perfection? Only one of you back there. See me after, and, we'll, and I'd love to talk with you and see how you did that. <laughs> no, but you see, we all recognize that, that we miss the mark and that we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of perfection. Have you ever actually thought about what perfection really is? You know, um, as I was thinking about Stephen Curry, who just won his fourth NBA championship, you know, early on in Stephen Curry's career, before he got to the NBA, before he got to college, in his senior year at high school, he was the very last person invited to go to this McDonald's All-American basketball camp. And nobody ever thought that Steph Curry's basketball career was ever going to amount to anything. And so there was one NBA scout that watched him, and Steph Curry tried to make perfection in his game. He was the first one that showed up in the morning, and he was the last one that left in the evening. And before he left, this NBA scout said he would swish 10 straight free throws. He would not leave the gym unless he swished 10 straight free throws. You know, it's hard just to make 10 in a row, but to swish 10 in a row is perfection. I've played basketball with your lead pastor, Dan. This might be the last time I've ever, I ever preach, and he makes about three or four out of ten. Anyway, um, but perfection is making ten out of ten and not even hitting the rim. We all have missed the mark. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. We have all missed a free throw in the game of life. All of us have missed the mark. But here is the great news, that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to save you and me, and by the knowledge of sin comes salvation. By the knowledge of sin comes salvation. You see, when we understand what sin really is, we realize that we need a savior. By the knowledge of sin comes salvation. And that brings us to our very first point, that the Spirit uses our conviction of sin for good. 
The Spirit uses our conviction of sin for good. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So the Spirit of God is working for the good in everything in our lives, even the conviction of our sin. Let me give you an example. I get to be a part of this just life-changing ministry. It is incredible what happens at Celebrate Recovery. It is amazing. We get to see people walk in here who are struggling with fear, anxiety, depression, low self-esteem, lost hope, addiction, and so many other things. And we get to watch as God convicts them and God starts working in their lives and he starts changing their hearts and he starts changing their minds. You know, we often tell people, give it six weeks and if your life hasn't begun to change, we will give you your misery back. (laughs) But you see, the Spirit starts convicting and using these difficult situations in people's lives to draw them to Christ, which brings them to celebrate recovery. And maybe it's an invitation. Maybe it's a post on social media. Maybe it's me sharing with you right now. And you can hear that still small voice, whether you're watching online, whether you're in the room, that voice is speaking to you and saying, hey, you need to go check it out on a Monday night. You know, the most amazing stories are the ones where somebody comes to support a loved one. They don't even think that they have any problems themselves. And all of a sudden, their lives begin to change because they begin to experience the freedom that God has really intended for them all along. And then honestly, something beautiful and special really happens. These people who didn't believe that they even needed to be there in the first place. They started sharing the life transformation that that God has has given them in their lives. And, And others are drawn to Christ and are drawn to celebrate recovery as well. And individuals are changed. Families are changed. Generations are changed. Communities and states are changed. And the world is changed. And you know what? That's the vision of Valley Real Life. It's to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. I can get excited about that. Absolutely. That's what the gospel is. It's to reach one person, introduce them to Christ, allow their lives to be changed, allow them to become a follower, and reach somebody else for Jesus. Praise God. Which brings us to our second point. The Spirit of God convicts us of sin to draw us nearer to him. Several years ago, I was struggling with alcohol and drug abuse and addiction and my walk with Jesus, and I was struggling with pride and humility and so many other things in my life. I was struggling so much that I had lost hope in my life, and I wasn't sure how to get that back. You know, I was working as a land surveyor, and I was in Madras, Oregon. How many of you know where Madras, Oregon is? A few of you. You know, it's, it's, it's this very dry, deserty place, desolate place, and that's where my life was. I was in this dry, desolate place in my life, and I was on this survey in Madras, Oregon, where there was this large cliff, and I walked over to this cliff three different times because I was going to jump off this cliff. And praise God and the Holy Spirit that he gave me the strength not to jump off the cliff that day. And I still remember the long drive home. It was lonely. And in my room the very next day, I remember crying out to God and praying to him. And the Holy Spirit put a scripture on my heart. Isaiah 58, 9. And then you will call and the Lord will answer. And you will cry out for help, and he will say, here I am. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you just needed somebody to say, and maybe it's right now, where you just needed somebody to say, here I am. Here I am. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is saying that to you right now. Here I am. And I honestly wish the story would have ended right there and all the pain would have just vanished. But you see, it was this moment in my life that the Holy Spirit was convicting me and opening my eyes to the sin that was was in my life. 
And ever so slowly, the walls in my life begin to come down. And you see, I didn't even know it at the time, but God was convicting me of my sin to draw me nearer to him. And to be honest with you, I had no clue that God had a bigger plan for my life. And I want you to know that God has a bigger plan for every single one of your lives as well. You see, it's not about you, and it's not about me. It's about somebody else. You see, I didn't realize that God might use my story to help somebody else, to help somebody else find hope, to help somebody else find freedom, maybe to help somebody else find Christ and spend eternity with him. Do you realize that that conviction that you might feel in your own life is for somebody else? That God is convicting you for the sake of somebody else's eternity. And it's because of his great love for us that there's no condemnation, but he loves us enough that he wants to draw us near to him. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, so now there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. It's because of his great love for us that there is no condemnation, but he loves us enough that he wants us and others to be freed from sin so we can be drawn nearer to him. Which brings us to our third and final point. The Holy Spirit brings freedom from the cycle of sin, which requires action on our part. I love Easter around here. It is like the Super Bowl for Valley Real Life. It is incredible. You know, this Easter at Valley Real Life was so awesome. Uh, you get to watch all the little kids come to the Easter egg hunts, and you get to watch them um, come and, and learn about Jesus. And there's so many newcomers that come, and they just get to experience Christ. It is incredible. And you know, one of the pieces that I love about Easter is that we, as staff and as volunteers, we park far away so some Somebody might be able to come and they can experience Jesus easier. They can walk closer. They don't have to walk as far and we get to get to serve in that way. And people don't even see it when we get to serve in that way. Well, something amazing happened to me as I was able to serve in that way. A few days after Easter, I was out in the parking lot getting ready to get in my car. And as I got in my car, I heard this loud chirp, you know, and what I did is I looked around and I thought, man, Somebody must have one of those old alarms, you know, those alarms that chirped at you when you walked by their car. And I thought, wow, well, somebody has one of those. And so um, I didn't think anything of it. I got in my car. About two or three days later, I, I was going to get in my car once again, and I heard a couple chirps. And now I'm getting a little suspicious, like, hey, this actually might be my car. And I'm kind of kicked my car and nothing happened. And um, a few days after that, I was the very last person to leave this church on a Monday night. And as I walked out to my car, it was chirping. And I was like, man, somebody must have installed a free alarm for me. I was like, there must be a bird inside my car. This is terrible. And so I drove home and I didn't park in the garage that night. And I drove home and I, and I was like, well, I don't want the whatever it is in there to, to be in my garage. So the next morning, I'm getting ready to take my son to school. And I say, hey, grab a couple brooms. We'll grab a broom. I'm going to open the hood. This bird's going to fly out. We'll be done with it. As I open the hood, there's this marmot staring right at me. <laughs> he is staring right at me. My son and I take the brooms and we're trying to get this marmot out. And he will not come out for nothing. There is no way this marmot is coming out of my car. And so it, I, I actually got a very good laugh at it because as I'm driving my son, now we had irritated the marmot. He had been in there over a week, so I know he's hungry. I know he's thirsty. As I'm driving down Barker to drive my son to Green Acres Middle School, we, we, we sound like an alarm going off. And I, 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 my son's like, hey, dad, you can drop me off like four blocks away. I'm like, heck no. <laughs> I said, heck no, we're pulling through and I'm waving at everybody when we walk in there. I, I, I drop my son off. I go to Tyrama. I, I go to Tyrama and Liberty Lake and I say, hey, can you guys help me get this marmot out? They're having a heyday, having a blast trying to get this marmot out. All of them are gathered around my car. They take the bottom of my car out 
and they finally get the marmot out. As all nine of them are chasing the marmot out of the shop, the marmot runs across the parking lot and he runs straight up into a brand new truck that they were working on. <laughs> as, the guy, as the guy is lowering my car, he says, well, he's not your problem anymore. <laughs> What's the moral of this story? The moral of this story is that there was something in my life that I couldn't take care of on my own. <laughs> I couldn't take care of it on my own. I needed some help from others. Do you have a marmot in your life? <laughs> is there something in your life that no matter where you go and what you do, it, it hangs around, it's with you, that the, the struggle just hangs on? Unhealthy relationships, gossip, the struggle of overeating, the use of foul language, evil thoughts. You see, we all have these, these sins. We all have these marmots in our life that hang around. But 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Praise God. You see, the only way that the power of sin can be broken is by the presence of and the promise of a superior power, and his name is Jesus. And if you're a believer in Christ, his spirit is within you. And if you're not a believer in Christ, it is through saving faith and receiving him as your Lord and Savior that you can be freed from the cycle of sin and have the promise of eternity. And my friends, today is your day. Whether you're a believer in Christ or whether you are not a believer in Christ, Today is your day. There's a story of a guy who walked a journey just somewhat like this. His name's Tyson. Go ahead and take a look. I was a pretty decent kid, made the honor roll, was MVP of my football team my senior year. And where it started for me was I had access to the beer cooler. After uh, sports games, me and a few of my buddies, we'd grab some beer, we'd go out and have a bonfire out, out in the wheat fields. And, and uh, once I had a taste of that alcohol, I thought, man, this is great. This is what life is all about. This is what I've been looking for my entire life. Fast forward 20 years and now I'm a full-fledged heroin addict living on the streets of Spokane. I'm a meth addict. I'm an alcoholic. Every single dollar that, that I come across, I use to, to get high. So I tried treatment. Um, all together, 14 uh, drug and alcohol treatment programs, inpatient, outpatient, detox. That didn't seem to take. It didn't last very long. Still in to support my habit. All together, 30 criminal charges, all connected to my substance abuse. I got picked up for uh, my second felony. It was a possession of a stolen motor vehicle. I'm in booking at Spokane County Correctional Facility. You go up these stairs, you grab your bedroll, you go past this bookshelf, and you grab your roll of toilet paper and your toothbrush. And sometimes there's books on the shelf. And usually there's not, but there's one book. And it was a, it was a study Bible that said, How to Find God. And I thought, you know what, why not? Nothing else has worked. And I started reading the scriptures and helped me realize that God created us to find our fulfillment in Him. But it also helped lead me to understand God's plan of salvation, the atonement, how He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And that if I put my faith in Him, that, that I will be forgiven, I'll be restored. So that's what I did in that jail cell. Just me and the scriptures, the Holy Spirit leading me. So when I got released from jail, I immediately went right back to what I knew. Bummed a cigarette from the first person I saw, Went to 7-Eleven, panhandled, bought a big old 24 ounce can of beer, went to Dope Man's house, got a shot of meth. But now I have the, the Holy Spirit in me. I'm born again. And now I have this conviction, like, hey, what am I doing? You know, this is darkness, this is lonely. And if it wasn't for that conviction, you know, I don't think I would have ever made the decision to, uh, uh, to reach out for help. Anytime I try to reach out to my dad, hustle him for money or anything like that, he said, I'm not giving you money, but I'll get you in this program, Teen Challenge. It's a year-long, faith-based, Christ-centered discipleship recovery program, and that's what I needed. I needed the structure. I needed, uh, I needed the help to learn how to be a man of God, how to read the scriptures and understand the scriptures. 10 months in my 12-month program, I sensed a, a call. God revealed to me that, you know, I love you and I'm doing all these things for you and I'm restoring your relationship with me and with your family and restoring your health, but it's not just about you. I want to do something through you. I entered into a, a year-long internship where I just learned just a ton. Got my parenting plan updated with my son, and so now I'm, now I'm having regular visits with my son and 
got my degree in the addiction studies program at Spokane Falls Community College. That's where I met my wife. And we've been married for almost seven years now. I got another call to interview for the executive director position of the Spokane Men's Campus of Adult and Teen Challenge. I accepted that position, so I've been an executive director for five years now. And now I get the privilege of helping other brothers that were once like myself, caught up in the bondage of drugs and alcohol and deceived and you know falling for the counterfeit. I get to help them to find the real, who's, who's Jesus Christ, and help them to, to walk that out as well and experience that freedom. The Holy Spirit is, is empowering. The Spirit of God is, is what gave me the ability to not only understand the scriptures, but also empower me to be able to walk out that freedom. And I, I mean, I celebrate 11 years clean and sober only because the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and only because of the atonement of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross for me. Isn't that awesome? That is so incredible. You know, Tyson's life could look like this at times. You know, my life can look like this at times. Maybe your life as well. It can be a mess and have a lot of loose ends going on. And there can be a lot of things in our lives that maybe we don't want. But you know what's crazy is, is that this isn't the end of the story. You see, God sees the other side of the story. You see, God sees perfection. God says that I can take all of these loose ends, I can take all of the messiness in your life, and I can make it perfect. God says that you are chosen. He says that you are worthy. God says that you are a masterpiece and that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God says that you are redeemed and you are his child. And God says that you are holy and blameless. He says you are victorious and that you are the light of the world. He says you are no longer a slave to the sin that you once lived in, but you are forgiven. Friends, we have a God that sees us as a perfect, perfect masterpiece. And you and I have the opportunity to live, to be, and to understand and love just like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather as one unified family and come together and, and just hear a word from you. And Lord, I pray that for everybody that's watching online, for everybody that's in this room, God, that, that your spirit would speak to each one of our hearts and our minds. That God, you would help us to take whatever step it is. Lord, whether it's finding a group, whether it's finding a spiritual partner, God, whatever it is to walk this journey of life, to move the marmots out and to, and to just gain righteousness in our lives, Father. God, we thank you that you are a good, good father. We thank you that you see perfection in our lives, that you see us as a perfect masterpiece. Lord, we give you praise tonight. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.